Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary friends. Welcome to Multicultural TV Talk, a Media Village podcast where we bring you exclusive interviews with talent and creatives from across entertainment, discovering their stories and how they are changing the face of stardom across the media. As always, I am your host, Juan Ayala. Thank you so much for tuning in. Now let's get to talking. So in honor of Native American Heritage Month, we are joined by a wonderful panel of actors for a special roundtable discussion. Today, we are joined by from Reservation Dogs and Resident Alien actress, writer, and producer, Sarah Podemski. From Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, and Dark Winds, actor Jeremiah Bitsui. And from Reservation Dogs, Rutherford Falls, and recently seen on Ghosts, actor and writer Dallas Goldtooth. Sarah, Jeremiah, Dallas, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Howdy. So uh, last year, we had a wonderful uh, discussion with some of your co-stars. So we had Defera Wunitai, Amber Midthunder, Rainbow Dickerson, and Isabella LeBlanc. And I'm so excited to continue these conversations. Um, I always try to use these platforms or uh, this particular platform for these conversations. We just had a Hispanic Heritage Month uh, roundtable. We had one for Pride. Um, you know, our show is called Multicultural TV Talks. We want to make sure to highlight everyone. So uh, again, thank you so much for, for being here. So I always love to start with this um, particular question. There is such a symbiotic relationship between culture and media, and it's always sort of tricky to determine which is in more power than the other. Um, so I'm curious, uh, we'll start with Sarah for this one, but Sarah, do you think that culture drives media or media drives culture, or is it a balance? Ooh, you're asking me the hard question. I think, um, I think it shifts. I mean, I feel like it, I think one influences the other, it can go back and forth depending on what's, you know, what the stronger force is. Um, I definitely feel that you know, for us and for, you know, indigenous narratives, it's been like a very long time coming. So it's kind of been this like slow burn that's finally led to a push um, that has been able to be received because of the last few years of just an, a new awareness about, you know, um, our stories our creative people that have finally been getting a choice, uh, sorry, a chance to, you know, write and direct. And so I feel like it's, it's kind of like luck, like it's opportunity meets preparedness. And we were kind of ready for this moment. And it kind of like met at a time where audiences were ready to see our stories told by us. So I think it's, I think it's kind of like, I think it's, you know, it's a balancing act and it can happen either way, but I definitely, you know, we've been waiting a very long time to have this kind of recognition and opportunity and I think that we are just ready. We are ready for everyone else to be ready for us. <laughs> and uh, Jeremiah, what about you? Do you think that um, one has more influence over the other or is it a balance? I agree with Sarah. I think that was a great response. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dallas, what about you? Uh, yeah, I can't add much more to that. That was really <laughs> well stated by Sarah. Sorry about that. but. <laughs> Um, so I'm curious also, um, we always love to ask these questions, I think in pretty much every episode of our podcast, but um, given that, as you said, Sarah, representation um, is increasing, um, it's not necessarily where it should be if you really look at the numbers. Like I know, again, Hispanic Heritage Month just passed, so I have these numbers just engraved in my brain, but you know, the Latino community makes up almost 20% of the US population. We get less than 5% of leading roles in any given project. Um, and it's, um, even more of a disparity for the indigenous community. I, I, if I remember correctly, um, again, these numbers are from last year. I don't know how they're still in my head, but uh, in, in Canada, the indigenous population, I believe is around 5% and in the US it's around three, but the representation is like less than one. If you look at leading roles in film and television, um, but there are still always those projects that growing up we watched and it stayed with us. So I'm curious, what is a performance or a story that made you feel represented for the first time? You know, Jeremiah, we'll start with you. I, I don't know. When I was when I was growing up, you know, you kind of growing up on the res, you 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 know you're you know you're Indian, you know you're from the res. But honestly, I think like the first characters visually that I connected with were um, uh, Asian characters that were in um, martial arts movies and films, and I was like a huge um ninja movie fan you know back in the 80s they're super cheesy but uh, so much fun and and I think like I visually connected because I was like oh I could 
I could be, I could be that. And, um, and then oddly, you know, that's kind of what, what drew me in, I think, to, to film and television is, is just uh, that, that thought of, I think, connecting those pieces. And then um, a film crew came to our, our uh, town, came to Chinle, Arizona, and, um, and uh, were looking for horses. And I grew up in a horse a rodeo family. And I think that in entertainment, the first thing I saw myself represented it in and it was an obvious one was uh was rodeo and i think that's kind of that that's that's a huge sport in all of our communities all the way from in north america you know from down in arizona all the way up to um uh, up into canada you know it, it's a big uh, it's a big sport and it's a big form of entertainment i just wasn't cut out for it you know i had allergies was allergic to horses hay cows so I, I really wasn't able to connect with with that, and um, and so allergies and ninjas what are what really kind of brought me into this uh, into this business, at least in seeing hey I could I could do that you know, um, and so yeah I think if I ever uh, got a ninja role who knows maybe it'd be like a, like a like a like a dog that actually caught the car you know. Uh, <laughs> I tell my wife, I'm like, she says, well, what's the goal? And I said, well, I, you know, honestly, I, I got into this as an adult, uh, came back to it after getting my heart broken and on the acting side. And I wanted to get into uh, directing originally. And, and recently I, I revisited that. And I thought, that's strange. I kind of went on this path, but I was meant to be, uh, you know, I went, moved to LA, like a lot of uh, creative hopefuls w wanting to get into directing. Um, so in short, uh, long story short, I, I really feel like, you know, that for people of color, you know, we we didn't have a lot to connect with originally, and and now there's there's so much which is which is great, you know, and uh, um, there, there's so much to pull from, and uh, and I think that's cool when you see little kids like like my daughter, she uh, Mo, Moana is is huge for her, you know. And so there's kind of those cross culture connections, but growing up, it's like Barbie dolls and, and these toys that you play with, they're a certain color. And on your TV show, you get used to seeing what that is, but that was, that was my closest connection. And uh, Dallas, what about you? What's a uh, performance that you saw growing up that made you feel represented? Oh, I want to say Three Ninjas Knuckle Up, the sequel to Three Ninjas, where they take down a toxic corporation who's trying to poison... Nin no, it wasn't that. <laughs> <laughs> Even though that was fun. Ninjas. Uh, Crystal Lightning wasn't that. That was one of her first roles. She was like a little kid in that one. And my uncle, uh, was, as well as in that. Anyways, the first movie I really felt like resonated. It really, the character was actually portrayed by Chief Dan George in Little Big Men. So a mm -hmm. um, little big man, Dustin Hoffman film. And a, um, it was just the, the comedy. It was the way the story was told, the way the per character was portrayed and how humor was expressed. That seems so, it, it just, it, it was humor that I'm used to growing up. Mm -hmm. It was, a, it was, it was um, you know, Chief Dan George is dying on a mountain. He's ready to leave this world, says his final words. But then he doesn't die. <laughs> and he's like, all right, well, let's, let's just go back to the village. Just that <laughs> sense of humor just like really speaks to my experience and how we and how humor and comedy shows up in my community. And that was like the really first one where I really, really like resonated with. The other one was uh, Graham Greene and Maverick movie with uh, Mel Gibson. And he doesn't have an accent. He doesn't have, he's actually just talks plain talk in that. Graham Greene, his performance in that was really, really, really uh, struck a lot of chord, struck a chord with me um, as a young, as a young one. So that's what I would say. And uh, Sarah, what about for you? Um, I, I was lucky that my, both of my older sisters were in films. So I think my eldest sister, Jen, was, you know, our, I was watching her on TV and in film when she was like 
you know, 17, 18, and there's nine years between us. So I was already really little and being able to be, you know, to think, oh yeah, this is a total possibility to have a career in this industry. <laughs> like I never, I never thought it wasn't, which I think was very lucky for me. Obviously it was difficult and heartbreaking as it always is. And uh, it didn't, you know, it wasn't like having her there made it any easier for me. I think um, a lot of people thought we were kind of interchangeable as we became adults that like, you know, it's like, let's just get one of the Podemskis. But I think um, I, I just grew up seeing that it was possible and, you know, being on sets from, you know, the age of like nine and 10 and visiting her and then working myself when I started, you know, at age 11. So um, yeah, there was, there was another time though, I remember when I saw, I think it was the black and white video by Michael Jackson and they have like all the traditional dancers. And I was like, that felt so like secret to like us, like powwow. And I, and like that it was like on a huge music video on like much music and MTV felt like, I, I felt like a secret was like being like released into the world. Like that was one of the times that I thought, whoa, that's so crazy. How are people going to react to seeing like, natives in regalia like it that was like one of the first kind of really shocking things of kind of felt like a huge um it was like in the in the main mainstream culture that was kind of other than like being able to see my sister in film and television that was like the first time that I was like I've never seen that outside of us going to powwow um so I'd say that that was probably another kind of moment you know, Dallas and Jeremiah, I'm, I'm sort of building off on that. I'm curious if either of you have experienced a moment like that where a project caught you by, by surprise or a, a particular type of representation in a project um, sort of caught you off guard or surprised you like that moment with Sarah. For, for me, I think uh, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of Heat and um, just that, that style of movie and seeing seeing Wes in there was 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 huge um yeah I think maybe for the place I was in that period of life and, and kind of um I don't know I, I wasn't solid that I even wanted to go back to this you know I, I the business at a young age it can we all know it can be vicious and uh, um I lost something that was really that was really close and I lost a lot of people uh, younger friends, a lot of childhood friends at that period of time, and there's just so much loss in that in that film, and um, and his character was just so was so solid, you know, and uh, and I don't know, I always wanted a big brother. Like I I, I grew up in in uh, from the res, I grew up in uh, like Hispanic neighborhoods and and um, and multi ethnic neighborhoods in the city and. And I just, everyone had a big brother, like you beat someone up and then, you know, somebody had a big brother, big cousin, and you'd always have to be able to deal with a big brother, big cousin, or a big homie, whoever. And then, you know, it was like, I never had that. And I always kind of, I don't know, I guess secretly wanted <laughs> like a West duty to show up at, at my school and start uh, taking, taking guys down or something. Um, but that, that that meant a lot for me. West Two's performance was was amazing, and I I really uh, I, I really felt connected to that that particular character. Uh, first of all, I want to say hi to Jeremiah because I've never got to meet Jeremiah, and I'm a little I'm like fangirling out. <laughs> you know, Jeremiah's performance in Breaking Bad was 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 a um, contemporary example for me. I'm like, oh. It's a native person in a role that isn't explicit like native like it's just a role it's just a person that's the role you know what i mean it isn't mm. that character isn't designed around being native and that was pretty actually empowering to see and she'll really want to uh tip my non-existent hat right now to jeremiah for mm. representing in that way and it also goes for a lot of other performers who've been given those gifts i think of i've already named them but um graham green and die hard three you remember he plays a cop Die Hard 3, they're trying to like disarm a bomb in a school and he's in there, he's telling people to get out. He was just a guy, just a cop. And I loved that. That was like really, really um, empowering to see because, you know, growing up, at least in the States in the 90s, 
you know, I, I think Indians have always been popular, right? Indians on horseback, Indians war hooping and, and burning the villages and circling the wagons. That's always been popular, right? It's, it plays into this whole American myth of how we, how this country was founded, but it's rare to see indigenous peoples as we are today, or, you know, not, our, our character is not skewed to play into those myths. And in the States, at least, that was much needed. And at least, you know, I don't, in the, in, up in Canada may be different, but in the States, at least it was very much a, an oversaturation of these, of these certain type of characters. And so I think about that. You know, one, actually one moment I really, really like it cares with me. I, obviously, I, it's obvious I'm a Graham Greene fan, fan here, um, is in um, the Powell Highway film that came out in uh, I think the late 80s. And there was a cameo by Graham Greene where he played a veteran, a vet, a Vietnam vet. It's like, it's like literally like two minutes, like a little two minute cameo bit. And that struck me to the core, his performance, because I have uncles who are Vietnam vets who carry mm -hmm. PTSD. I've, I've been in that space where one of my uncles had a, a moment and um, over trauma came forward. And so those performances, I speak to this is that it just feels so much real when you see your life experience reflected on, uh, on screen. And that's what I, as a young actor, as a young like as, as an artist, that was what emboldens me and empowers me to see that uh, even to this day. Uh, speaking of Graham Greene, I mean, he's, he's a legend, you know, obviously we all know and love him from so many different projects, but uh, I was fortunate enough to um, attend D23 in, in California and they announced the cast of Echo and Graham Greene is in the show uh, pretty much, I think with the exception of Vincent D'Onofrio, it's an all indigenous cast, Devery Jacobs is in the show. It's like you have indigenous mm -hmm. people in the MCU. And uh, I was uh, lucky enough to, to have just seen the new Black Panther movie and you have indigenous Latinos in that movie and seeing that culture represented that is so severely underrepresented. So mm -hmm. it's just been so wonderful to see, even just comparing to like when I was a kid growing up, like, you know, coming up uh, 20 years ago, seeing sitcoms as a teenager and how much that level of representation has changed. And as Sarah said, it's like, we've all been here. We're ready to, to be the representation. Uh, we just haven't been given the chance, but I'm curious what each of you think, uh, like what's the call to action? What is the way for uh, networks, studios to be able to tell this type of storytelling in a more authentic way? That's a tough one, I think, Sarah. Do you want to be a folks? <laughs> That's really hard to answer. Sarah, you should take that. <laughs> um, I actually think it's a little bit of kind of what Dallas was saying, which I think the call to action is just that like we've proven we can perform. Cast us in any role. You know, I love the characters that I play and I love like that I can use my lived experience to bring to a character, but I can also bring my lived experience to like a character that just happens to be native that's a cop on like a huge cbs show i want to start seeing us in those roles i want to see start seeing us in roles where we just get to show up on set and play like everybody act, uh, every other actor does i always say this thing like i'd love to show up on a set and not i mean i get to do it when i work on you know a show like res dogs where like you know everyone has this lived experience i don't have to like take dream catchers off the wall in my house and i don't have to take turquoise off of my rings and you know in wardrobe but like you know that's happened a number of times but just this idea of being able to show up on set and like know my lines and play with the other actors and not have to navigate like you know the the the, the culture of the character being the leading you know the driver of my narrative um yeah. it would be just great to see you know jeremiah in a you know, a Kung Fu movie and just be some guy who's doing, you know, ninja. crushing, crushing Kung Fu, you know, <laughs> or ninja, or, you know, like, so that's, I think that that's the call to action is just like, you've seen us perform, we've knocked it out of the park. Now let's, let's, let's just work. Let's get us to work. Let's be integrated into like, you know, everyday shows. I think we're all we're all ready for that and we I think you know the conversations that I have with other indigenous actors and performers is yes we still want to tell our community stories but we also want those moments like we all said where like a kid is watching and they're like oh my god that's just a cop and that's just a nurse 
And that's like my auntie who works at the hospital, or that's like my, mm-hmm. you know, cousin who is the receptionist at the health sports club that gets in a crazy, insane situation and ends up, you know, having a romance that like, you know, like all these crazy things that normal characters get to get into that are like really, um, you know, non-specific to our heritage, um, I think is, that's my, that's what I would say is just like, look at us aside from our ethnicity Mm. and see, you know, our potential to, of just being able to tell stories in any context. In the episode of Res Dogs this season where um, your character and and several of the other um, adult female characters go to the conference, I'm like, can we get like a Bad Moms movie with this cast? Like, you know, it's just like, can we just get a comedy where they're just like <laughs> night on the town? You know, like, yeah. like you said, just like, there's so many genres and things that our communities can just be like plugged into yeah. and it doesn't revolve around like let's show them how Latino we are, how indigenous we are. It's like, that's not the story. It doesn't have to be that, you know? And so many people know that story, like going to conferences, like anybody knows that lifestyle who's ever been part of that. And I Mm -hmm. think like the comments that I got from indigenous and non-indigenous people, they saw themselves represented in that aside from, you know, us being native women. Mm -hmm. It was great to see the native women, like, you know, see themselves seen and like see this experience that like nobody else has, you know, really... Um, shown on television or in film before Um, but it was also great to just see it was like a situational comedy you know you see Mm -hmm. the conference you see the you know the people attending the conference the dynamics the like conversations all the drama all that stuff and it's you know anybody can really relate to that who knows you know who's ever been to a conference and uh, Jeremiah what about you what what would you say is a call to action or, or what can change behind the scenes um to help make this representation more authentic I think that you know the 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 writing is is uh, especially now like we're in the golden age of of TV and um, you know television mainstream television is, isn't even something that you can fund. Uh, you know, I had I had a friend um, who uh, in a very influ- influential place had the ability to to fund his own first season. Um, and spent a great, great deal of money, um, like eight digits of, of cash into it, and then realized that he couldn't do anything with that. And that was really, um, that was really interesting to me because then I thought, like, wow, that's how powerful writing can be. You know, the the power of of have being in a place where you can, um, you can get your voice out there. You know, it's it's not even something necessarily that that money can buy. You can't buy yourself into it. So it it's a really interesting space when you get into television, the business side of it, at least with that. Um, I, I think so much of it does stem from writing, and writing such a scary place. Um, you know, I, I've I've written things that I I don't even I don't know some things I've never even showed anyone, but I I kind of go back and I play with things and I uh, you know it's 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 a good exercise as well as an actor to know and as well as a director or a producer I think you just get that's so much of the skeleton of of what we do um if you write and you never even share it of course that's that's uh, a lot of us are, are there um but at least you know the process and you could you could respect you could respect that that process um but I, I really, I really think that uh, w- whatever you have the ability to, to get involved in and in participate in, if that's like a little independent film, or 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 doing your own thing, even if it's fumbling and you don't know the the formal process of of things and you're just uh, figuring it out, I think that when my parents got their first uh, camcorder. And I, I would try to reenact Saturday Night Live and these ninja movies, all these ninja movies I was watching. And that they gave me a good context for, um, for how that all comes together when I actually stepped on my first set. Because when I first stepped on my first real set, I was like, oh, wow, this is how, okay. Yeah, that, you know, that, that makes ton ton of more sense than what I was trying to do, uh, you know, with, with my camcorder. Um, so I, I really think, you know, point being is, is just 
just starting in, in with what you have and you may fumble. Um, it's the same thing in business. I mean, I, I tell a lot of young entrepreneurs, I, I mean, I started my first one when I was 19. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Um, my strength was sales. And I knew from having a telemarketing job to get on the phone and make 200 calls a day. And I thought that's what it takes to be successful in that business. And so in my own business, that's all I could translate it to. So really just, just bringing what you know and, and building a base based on what's around you. I, I think for, for young people or for anyone, I think we drive so much into young people, but what about middle-aged folks that you know are kind of in a place where they're thinking, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll take a shot at this. I mean, Morgan Freeman's a perfect example, someone who's you know, he, he didn't necessarily, uh, we don't know him as a young man. Uh, we, we know this great body of work that he built at, at a later age, which is, uh, which is, which is awesome. Sorry about that. I got a call, but um, yeah, that's, that's my answer. I kind of went off on a tangent, but just starting where you can basically, you know, even if it's joining a local crew or film festival or just, just starting that process. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the showrunner for uh, for Res Dogs, Sterling, started sort of a, in the festival circuit and, and eventually was able to, to cross over to TV. And I think that's such a great place for um, for people to sort of build up that network, like you said, because um, I feel like because of the drive that networks and studios have to increase diversity, they are doing a lot of sort of scouting at these festivals to see like who are rising voices, who are, who are young voices, the, who are like the people to watch, to, to be able to develop things with them. In uh, Dallas, I'm curious as a, as a theater maker as well, my editor went and saw your play at, in, a, in Connecticut at, a, at Yale. <laughs> um, so I'm curious, uh, what, what do you have to, to add to that, to sort of like what can folks do behind the scenes and things like that to increase the authenticity of the representation? I feel like what excites me is the narrative that we often encounter, that I often encounter, I'll speak from a, my, an eye position, is I often encounter the narrative that as Native people, we are engaging, interacting, and sometimes that conflict with not just the outside world, but specifically with whiteness, with white folks, right? And, and that's often the narrative is like, as we are engaging with whiteness, we are combating with whiteness and all these different forms, however it's manifested. What intrigues me is that, you know, I would love to see us expand that narrative. How do we engage with other communities of color? Like I would wanna explore how do we engage the greater world? And because that's what our lived experience is. It's not just, you know, we don't just people on a reserve, the vast majority of native people live in urban areas, right? It's not just rural reservations. Like we are engaging and enmeshed in communities that are very diverse. And so there are a plethora of stories of how that engagement looks like and sounds like, right? I mean, I, for 10 years, I lived in East Oakland and did work in the, in the school system there. We had natives and Latinos all together. You had folks all were interacting. So there's such, so, there's such a deep richness there. Mm. And I would love for us to really explore that and I think we're just now getting to a place where people are like, okay, like, oh, like Native folks can make store, make good shows and make movies. We're like, hey, man, we've been telling great stories this whole entire time. Now you're just, you're, you're just now finally putting resources behind us. We've, we've been doing this. And, you know, I think that there's a, I think there's a really strong potential to explore how other, how communities engage across the spectrum. And so I want to encourage us, even as artists, as writers or actors, to explore that as well. Like, what is our, how do we engage with the world on the entire spectrum, as opposed to limiting ourselves to one narrative that we've been fed, and that we feel like in order to be successful, we have to feed into this narrative. I think I really want us to explore the greater, um, I just, the, the wild possibilities of stories out there. So that's what I'd say. Can I interject something to go back? Just because I know that Kung Fu and ninjas are two different things. But when you said ninja, I thought of David Carradine and Kung, Kung Fu the legend continue. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's why I was like, yeah, Kung Fu movie. And then I was like, that's not a ninja at all. <laughs> I was like, anyone, li anyone listening is going to be like, wow, this lady thinks that 
that's all the same thing. <laughs> and she is a racist. <laughs> I used to, uh, no problem. My, my dad used to come in and again, I was by a bunch of renegade cowboys. And then, uh, you know, of course, on, on my other family side, you know, very, uh, uh, is, you know, on the social justice side of name. But like, yeah, my dad used to come in and, hey, cut it out with all that kung fu. And I was trying to, <laughs> like, yeah, this is karate, man. This is, this, is, yeah, this is kung fu or, you know, that's not kung fu. And so, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for saying <laughs> Oh my God. I just watched too much Kung Fu The Legend Returns as a child. So that's that where my brain went. Yeah, I hear that. I think what Dallas said, said was, was great because it's like, you know, with the reboot of a lot of these things, and it just made me think with, with Sarah bringing up um, Kung Fu The Legend and, and knowing kind of the background from, from uh, Bruce's experience. Um, that Bruce Lee, you know, having that the same barriers, you know, and um, I, I agree. I mean, I think rather than uh, just, I think isolating ourselves, you know, my, you know, the, it was interesting that my, the first identification that I drew to were were uh, were these characters, you know, these characters on a whole other side of the world that that you know relatively look look like they could be on the Navajo res, you know. Um, and uh, and complete polar opposite. I think what it was is of the culture I was in. You know, none of them were on horses. None of them, even though if you're in another culture, you're like, are you kidding me? Cowboys? Like that's that's badass. And you know, some of the stories I grew up with, like with with my father and my uncles, and them running around all across the U.S. Planes, trains, automobiles, and broken bones. I mean, there's so many cool stories there. But it's so it's so local, and it's so like it's what I know um, that, you know, uh, Kung Fu masters and, um, and ninjas are, are still really interesting to me. <laughs> hey, it, honestly, what it makes me like, it's the same with me. I grew up on martial arts movies, like all of, like just a whole range of it is this generation. And I think previous, just we're in a generation of storytellers that are very much like we grew up in pop culture. Like we grew up with that, you know, the 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 like all that is the 80s and 90s and 2000s all like jammed into our minds like it's all there and like you know i i that's why i think really we're seeing some different types of stories than were you in the past because you know at least i know like i remember and this is cliche as as it it just may sound cliche it's like i remember before the internet was widespread right and then that cusp when we got everyone had cell phones and all that stuff like we are tapping into like a whole range of like pop culture that's influenced us you see that in res dogs you see that in all these other shows you see that all come up and that's our experiences right and it's not uh beads and feathers and ceremonies all the time it's obscure freaking kung fu movies or action jean-claude van damme action flicks or Drew Barrymore movies never before never been kissed like those are all floating in our minds and those all influence us as actors and performers at least it influenced me mm -hmm. so um that's why I, I going back to what Sarah said like I'm excited I'm I would be excited to play other roles where it's not it's not based on my identity as a native person but where I can be in a silly goofy rom-com I guess with Drew Barrymore I'm not sure what I'm trying to say here <laughs> But you get what I'm saying, <laughs> hopefully. And uh, we always love to to end our interviews with this question. Um, so if you had this sort of like back to the future moment, and we're gonna take like time paradoxes out of the equation, so don't worry about that. But if you were able to go back and and give your 13 year old self some advice, what would you say? Hmm. Oh, I have one that I I've been thinking about recently. Um that I actually said on a, a an Instagram live and um, for the episode of Res Dogs, the ladies episode. And because someone said, what what advice would you give to other actors that want to, for like native actors that want to get into the industry? And I, for so long, because the dominant culture was European, you know, 
Caucasian European actresses, small, mousy, delicate, you know, what's the manic pixie dream girl situation that I grew up with. I always tried to be like demure and like soft, talk quieter and like not use my head a lot and not use my facial expressions. I, I tried to go away from who I was authentically as like, you know, a loud Jewish native, like, am I a millennial? I'm 40. What am I? <laughs> Is that a, no, that's millennial. Yeah. Yes. Millennial. You know, so it's like a very specific, you know, kind of character that like is me that I live my life as. And I think as an actor for so long, I tried to kind of fit into the dominant culture of like this, you know, Caucasian young woman being delicate and like not too harsh and not too funny, like not too that whole kind of thing. And only like in the last few years that I've started kind of leaning more into who I am and like my authentic unique voice that I bring to characters um, is when I started to get noticed more and started to get more work. So I think if I told my 13 year old self, like just focus on you and do your thing, you know, your unique, you know, your low voice, like everything that every, all casting agents, everyone told me that like, she looks so young, but she has an older voice, like all these things that kind of got in my head. I wish I just could have told myself like the roles will find you just lean into yourself, you know, be your authentic self, do the tapes the way that you want to do them, not the way you think that people want to see you or the dominant culture that's popular. So I think I would have probably had a much easier time mentally and emotionally if I would have accepted who I was and accepted my differences and really leaned into my unique perspective and point of view that I had. Um, and that's usually what I try and tell people is that like, that's what people want to see. They want to see new, unique people we're tired of the same old thing. That's what people are looking for now. Everybody's looking for, you know, that next unique actor that's going to do something that no one's done before. Yeah, there's there's things that still I think, and you know, we 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 deal with all the way through our our life. And yeah, I, I think like just the loss. I think that it's hard to lose people when you're young, and you, you place a lot of blame. And I think just someone listening to you and telling you you're you're enough, you know. Um, I don't know. I still I still struggle with that. So um, I think it's it's it, you can give up early because you just don't think you're enough. And um, I think that was that'd be something I really needed to hear um, at the age of thirteen. Uh, I feel like when you're, you don't feel like you're enough, you end up going and doing all these things in excess that, that make you feel like you're, you're more. And, uh, but just having like a big brother type, you know, if that was me, uh, 42, 42 year old Jeremiah, big brother talking to a 13 year old Jeremiah, that would be it. You know, just listening to what I have to say and letting you know you're enough. And Dallas sticks up. I would say, don't be a shit ass. I don't know if I can start. <laughs> I, no, I would, I don't know, man. I would, I guess it is a really good and deep question. I feel like not to put, I would want to tell myself not to put so much pressure on myself to be, to be the savior, right? Of, of your family or community or to be whatever, role that puts added pressure just be yourself and what i think sarah says really right to the heart of it is just to not shy away from your complete self right and to really like know that that is what makes you beautiful that's what makes you cherished and really that what's like that's what makes you successful and I, for me that's very much true right um i've always been very silly very over the top crazy facial expressions now and um and i would would tell myself to to lean into that even more and not to be afraid of that and not shy away from that look i'm i'm relatively new to like these these are like veterans these are sacred veterans on this video here jeremiah and sarah I took my hat off and sing a veteran song for you all in this in in this career but like i'm new to it so i'm watching like other actors and i'm like they don't move their eyebrows as much as i do why do i i <laughs> I'm like this all the time and they're all like 
you killed my son. And I'm like, what? Why won't you use your eyebrows? Like, it's just weird. It's like, see, that's where I'm like, lean into that's who you are. And that's what folks will go for. Thank you all so, so much for such a wonderful conversation. And to everyone watching or tuning in, you can see our guests in Reservation Dogs streaming now on Hulu, Dark Winds on AMC Plus, and Ghosts on CBS and Paramount Plus. And of course, you can follow us at Media Village Com on Instagram. Head over to MediaVillage.com for all of our reviews, interviews, podcasts, and more. I'm Juan Yala. This is Multicultural TV Talk. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>